this too? He took it all. <laughs> As I said, Easter is a time to remember and focus on the greatest event in this earth's history. It, it's time to focus on the death, burial, and resurrection of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And I, 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 I would put it this way, even a greater emphasis on the resurrection. You see, talking about the cross of Christ is incomplete without the resurrection. See, not only was the resurrection of Jesus everything to his disciples, it, it plays a vital part in our redemption. So today I want to look at four important reasons why the resurrection of Jesus is significant to the Christian in terms of our salvation. And as we look at, the, uh, at these, there will be some repeating of, of some of the things that we have already looked at in the book of Ephesians and in Romans when we went through those books. But first, let me look at the resurrection uh, through the eyes of the disciples. 
Now, you will remember that the disciples were Jews, and they were victims of Judaism all their life. They had been taught that the Messiah was not to be a suffering servant, but was to be a conquering king. Well, he would destroy the Roman Empire and establish his kingdom. This was the hope that the disciples had when they accepted Jesus as their Savior. Now, even though they had been told more than once by Jesus himself about his death and resurrection, they were so engrossed in their preconceived ideas of the Messiah that they failed to see the significance of his death and resurrection until after it took place. So this morning, let's look at the four important reasons why the resurrection is extremely significant and vital to us as Christians. Number one, the resurrection of Jesus vindicated his righteousness, which he obtained for us so that we may be able to be qualified for heaven. Romans 1.1. 1, 1. You remember when we went there? There in Romans 1.1, 1, 1, Paul introduces himself as the apostle called by God, separated in order to preach the gospel to the Gentiles. And then in verse 2, he tells us the gospel was promised beforehand through the prophets, but now it's no longer a promise because it's a reality. And the reality concerns Jesus Christ, the Son of God, according to the seed of David, Paul says, and the Son of God, according to the life of holiness he lived. In other words, Jesus was both man and God so that he might be the Savior of the world by his humanity. He joined himself to us. Remember when we talked about it, that in the Incarnation and this human race that needs redeeming through his, uh, and through his divinity, he joined us to the Father in heaven. Can we get an amen? amen. Yeah, okay. I just want to make sure you're still with me, you know. <laughs> okay. And then in verse 4, I want you to see what he says. And verse 4, he gives proof of that righteousness. We got a technical problem here. You want to go to the next slide. Whoops. Okay. And declared to the Son of God with power according to the spirit of holiness. How? By the resurrection of from the dead. Now, what has the resurrection of Jesus to do with the spirit of holiness or righteousness which was revealed in his life? I'm glad you asked that because I, I just can't wait to tell you. Because if Jesus had sinned either in thought, word, or deed, the Father would have had no right to raise him from the dead. You, you remember, the ultimate power of sin is what? Death. The law says that the soul that sins, it must die. Remember Romans 6.23? The wages of sin is death. Jesus did bear the sins of the world, but he had no sin himself. And when he died, he paid the price of sin at the cross. It was our sin that put him in the grave, but sin couldn't keep him in the grave because he had lived a perfect, sinless life. In fact, God raised him from the dead to prove, and, and by him doing that, it proves that the righteousness that he had obtained in his earthly mission, in his humanity, was perfect.
To put it another way, God delivered Jesus to bear the wages of sin so that we could be justified from our own sins. And then he raised him up as evidence that that justification was perfect. Number one, the resurrection of Jesus vindicates the righteousness which he obtained for a sinful human race. Number two, the resurrection of Jesus guarantees, did you get that? Guarantees our resurrection. You remember what we learned in our study of uh, Ephesus? I won't ask you to repeat it, but I, I hope you remember. <laughs> here's, here's the thing. There is nothing that we will experience as Christians, whether it is in terms of our new birth or standing before God as justified, which brings us peace, joy, and assurance, or whether in terms of Christian living or the hope that we have in the resurrection from the dead and ascending into heaven with Jesus, all of that, all of it is based on the fact that we have already received it in the history of our Lord Jesus Christ. Can I get a hallelujah? There you go. I mean, come on, you got to get active here. You know, th this is important stuff, right? This is stuff that brings us peace. It brings us joy. It brings us assurance. So we can get excited about it, right? All right, look at 1 Corinthians 1.30. It is because of him that you are in Christ Jesus, who has become for us wisdom from God, that it is our righteousness, holiness, and redemption. Therefore, since Jesus is the source of our Christian experience, his resurrection guarantees our resurrection. In other words, we will experience the resurrection because in Christ, now listen, in Christ we have already been raised from the dead. Remember what we read in Ephesians 2 and verse 6? That we were already sitting in heavenly places in Christ? I want you to turn in your Bibles, if you would, to 1 Corinthians, the 15th chapter. 1 Corinthians 15. And I want to begin with verse 12. Just say amen when you're there. 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 12. It's here that Paul exposes a theological problem that uh, was being experienced by the church members there in Corinth. There was some Corinthian church members who questioned the resurrection uh, of Jesus. I want you to look at verse 12. But if it is preached that Christ has been raised from the dead, how can some of you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? I want you to notice how Paul answers this. His proof that Christians have the hope of the resurrection is the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Verses 13 and 14. If there is no resurrection of the dead, that even... that then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, our preaching is useless and so is your faith. In other words, if the source of our resurrection, which is Jesus, did not, uh, did not raise from the dead, then there's no hope for any of us. But if he rose from the dead, then we all have hope. Look at verses 15 through 19. More than that, we are then found to be false witnesses about God. For we have testified about God that he raised Christ from the dead. <clears throat> 
but he did not but he did not raise him if in fact the dead are not raised for if the dead are not raised then Christ has not been raised either and if Christ has not been raised your faith is futile you are still in your sins and then those who have fallen asleep in Christ are lost if only for this life we have hope in Christ we are to be pitied more than all men. Our hope is not in this world. You, you with me still? Our hope is not in this world. Our hope is in the world to come. And the beginning of that world is the resurrection of the believers. Look at verse 20. But Christ has indeed been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. And then in verses 21 and 22, he makes these statements about in Adam and in Christ. For since death came through a man, the resurrection of the dead comes also through a man. For in Adam all die, so in Christ all will be made alive the resurrection of Jesus is the guarantee of the resurrection for every believer now to reinforce this I want you uh, I want you to listen uh, to what Paul says in first Thessalonians 4 and verse 14 where he's talking to the believing Christians in Thessalonica he says, for if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, you, you know where I'm talking about? Understand, Paul is not using the word if as if uh, there was some doubt of the resurrection of Jesus. What he's saying is, in view of the fact that we believe Jesus Christ died and rose again, even so God, pardon me, even so God will bring him those who fall asleep in Christ. In verse 15 and onward, he continues to explain that the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are living will be transformed by the twinkling of an eye from corruption to incorruption. Notice how Peter puts it in 1 Peter 1.3. Praise be to God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us new birth into living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. You understand that a Christian who dies is just resting in Christ. And when Jesus comes from heaven and he makes that tremendous cry at the trump of God and says, let the dead in Christ be raised. All the believers who have died in Christ will conquer the grave because their victory is the result of the victory of Jesus Christ who conquered the grave. That's fantastic, isn't it? That gives us such a, such a tremendous hope. And so Peter is saying, praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Number two, the resurrection of Jesus guarantees our resurrection. Number three. The resurrection of Jesus makes his intercessory ministry in the heavenly sanctuary possible. You're, you remember that uh, the acceptance of Jesus doesn't change our nature one bit. You, you remember we talked about that? See, we are still potentially 100% sinners. Therefore, as long as we are living in this world, this condemned world by sin, we need a mediator. Okay? 
And as long as we are sinners, now think about this. As long as we are sinners, how long are we going to be sinners? Yeah. Until Jesus comes, <laughs> when he changes this corruption into incorruption, as long as we are sinners, we will have a mediator. Isn't that great? Because Jesus conquered death. He has gone to heaven and is now sitting at the right hand of the Father, interceding for us. And I want you to notice what Paul says about this wonderful gospel in Romans 8. He spends several chapters in Romans discussing the gospel from every conceivable angle. He begins in chapter 3, verse 21, and he's going to end continue and end in chapter 8 in verse 30. And then having done that, he concludes in verse 31 of chapter 8. He says, What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? That's tremendous, isn't it? If God is on our... Think about this. If God is on our side... It doesn't matter who is against us. And yes, I know the devil accuses us day and night, but we have an advocate. Romans 8, 34. Who is he that condemns? Christ Jesus, who died more than that, who, has, who was raised to life, is at the right hand of God and is also interceding for us. The Apostle John, he realizes that we're still sinners and that we're living in a sinful world. And so here's what he says in 1 John 2 and verse 1. My little children, these things I write to you so that you may not sin. And if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. Again, praise God. So the resurrection of Jesus makes it possible for us to have an intercessor. And that intercessor is Jesus Christ, who sits at the right hand of the Father, representing every believer. Now, he's our advocate, he's our savior, and he is able to save anyone who comes to God through him because there is no condemnation for those who are in, what? Christ Jesus. In Christ, as Jesus himself said in John 5, 24, we have already passed from death to life. So number three, the resurrection of Jesus makes his intercessory ministry in the heavenly sanctuary possible. Number four, the resurrection of Jesus proved once and for all that God's power manifested in Jesus is greater than all the power of sin that Satan can muster through our sinful flesh. So let that sink in a moment. We, we need to, to hold on to that fact. We, we need to let that be part of us. Do you, you see, you might remember when we studied the book of Romans in chapter 7, <coughs> Paul spoke of our sinful, or our sin problem. In Romans 7, 14, he says, The law is spiritual, but we humans, whether believers or unbelievers, are carnal, sold, as slaves to sin, because of, and because of this, it's impossible. Do you get that? It's impossible for human beings in and of themselves to live a holy and righteous life. And, and yes, we may desire to do that which is good. <laughs> we may choose to do the will of God. We may delight in the law of God. But how to fulfill that desire, how to perform that which we have chosen to, 
to do is impossible in and of ourselves. We need to understand that. And I should say, I know that's what Paul is saying. And, and I know that he's not discussing the Christian controlled by the Holy Spirit. He's talking about the believer who is trying to live a holy life in and of himself. I know that because at the very end of Romans 7, 20, um, in verse 25, the second part, that last part of that verse, Paul says this. So then, I myself, notice the emphasis on I myself. In my mind, am a slave to God's law, but in the sinful nature, a slave to the law of sin. And the Greek is, is much stronger than the English translation, translation. What he is actually saying is, left on my own, independent of God's spirit, I can serve the law of God only with my mind. I can choose to obey the law of God. I can make promises to keep the law of God, but my flesh will not allow me to do what I have chosen to do. Why is that? Because the law of sin is in my members and I am a slave to it. Now, you might think that, <laughs> well, pastor, there's no hope then. I got great news. <laughs> we would think that, except that Paul says in the first part of verse 25, after crying out uh, concerning his wretchedness in verse 24, he says, I thank God through Jesus Christ. That's the answer. And like Paul, we can... That can be our shout also. I thank God through Jesus Christ. Yes, I know I'm a sinner. Yes, I know I'm wretched. But I thank God through Jesus Christ. Not only do we have a Savior who saved us. He saved us from our sins, but we have a Savior who saved us from sin itself. Sin as a power, sin as a force. Jesus Christ not only bore the sins of the world, but as Paul says in Romans 8, 3, he condemns sin in the flesh. So what's the greatest proof that Jesus condemns sin in the flesh? The resurrection. When Jesus rose from the dead, he proved that his power over sin is greater than the power of sin in us. That's fantastic. In Romans 8, 2, Paul tells us that the spirit of life and Christ has set us free from the power of the law of sin and death. And that means this. In Christ, these two forces met the spirit of life in him and the spirit of sin that was residing in the humanity that he assumed. These two forces met in Jesus and God allowed our sins to take him to the grave. But our sins couldn't keep him there. The spirit of life raised him from the dead. And in view of this, Paul makes a wonderful statement in Romans 8 and 11 which we must apply to our Christian living. Notice what he says. I think I put it up here. Let's see. Yeah. But the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead, in other words, the spirit of Christ that conquered sin from the grave, dwells in you. He who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. And that's why Paul says in Romans 8, 4, that when Christians walk in the Spirit, the righteousness of the law will be fulfilled in them, not because they're able to do it in and of themselves, but because the Spirit of life, which proved its power against sin through the resurrection of Jesus, dwells in them dwells in the Christian. So we rejoice 
and the resurrection of Christ because, number one, it vindicates Christ's righteousness, which justifies us. Number two, it guarantees our resurrection. It, number three, it makes it possible for Jesus to be our intercessor so that even though we are sinners, we can look people in and ourselves in the eye and know in whom we believe and he is able to save us. And number four, the resurrection of Jesus gives us the hope of conquering the flesh and living a life that is pleasing to God. So I say again, Easter is not about chocolate bunnies and Easter egg hunts. It's about the greatest event to ever take place for the salvation of humanity. Let us pray. Father in heaven, I thank you so much for the love of Jesus. I thank you for his sacrifice on the cross for our sin. And I thank you immensely for his resurrection, which guarantees our resurrection, which guarantees we have life. Oh, thank you, Father. And I pray that as each of us leave this building today, we can go forth with confidence of knowing who we are in Christ and, and with the assurance of the hope that we have in the future. In Jesus, I pray. Amen.